So welcome to lecture series on advanced geotechnical engineering and uh, we are in module 4 and discussing about the shear strength of the soils. So this is module 4 lecture 7 on stress strain relationship and shear strength of soils. So in the previous lecture we introduced our, uh, ourselves about the PQ space and uh, discussed about the Mohr Coulomb criterion in depth. Then in this particular lecture we will introduce ourselves to methods for determining shear strength especially in the laboratory by two predominant methods that is uh, direct shear test and triaxial compression method and uh, thereafter we will introduce ourselves to stress paths relevant to the triaxial compression test and uh, the drainage conditions. So uh, after having covered these uh, uh, contents uh, we will be looking uh, into the, the triaxial behavior and stress state and analysis of uh, uh, unconfined compression, unconsolidated undrain and consolidated undrain and consolidated drain and other special tests and drainage conditions. So uh, we have several methods uh, for determining uh, you know uh, shear strength in the laboratory uh, predominantly they are like uh, direct shear test and triaxial compression test and uh, then there are some simple shear test and uh, plane strain uh, triaxial test uh, like that we have uh, you know several classes of uh, uh, tests which are actually can be done in the laboratory for determining the uh, you know the shear strength uh, behavior shear strength parameters of the soils under considerations both un, in uh, disturbed or undisturbed conditions or for the or for the remolded conditions and then we also have some methods for determining direct or indirect methods for uh, you know arriving at uh, uh, the strength parameters based on the some parameters which are actually measured in the field. So uh, the different determination of the shear strength parameters can be achieved through laboratory or through field tests and uh, the laboratory predominantly the direct shear test and triaxial tests are performed uh, uh, you know traditionally and uh, there are also some other classes of tests like direct, direct simple shear test and torsional ring shear test and plane strain triaxial test and uh, for very soft soils if you wanted to determine where the, the sample uh, uh, making is difficult then in that case uh, we have laboratory vein shear test and uh, if we, we also have a fall cone test where you know it also indicates the penetration of the cone indicates an interpretation of uh, you know the shear strength measurement. In the field when we are having a soft soil uh, when the sample uh, pickup is very difficult then you know vane shear test at different depths is also popular. And then we also have some uh, you know pocket penetrometer tests and the pressure meter test will give the in situ properties or in situ elastic modulus uh, of soil. And uh, as we discussed uh, you know the static cone pentrometer test uh, which actually gives the cone resistance and uh, frictional resistance or shaft resistance and with the uh, by interpreting the sh uh, shaft resistance and uh, frictional resistance we will be able to get uh, you know an idea about uh, the uh, shear strength parameters. Similarly the standard penetration test which is uh, you know uh, the resistance of the soil is measured by the SPT n value. So we have number of correlations uh, which can actually can give uh, you know for different n values uh, you know by their uh, undrained cohesion or uh, you know the friction angle of a soil. So most common uh, laboratory test used to determine the shear strength parameters C or phi in case of total stress parameters and C dash and phi dash in case of effective uh, you know stress parameters. So total strength parameters are called as C and phi and effective strength parameters are called as C dash and phi dash and uh, they are basically the direct shear test and triaxial shear test. So let us look into the first the direct shear test and it is also called as a shear box test and this box can be square or circular in shape and this box sizes are predominantly 60 mm by 60 mm or we have 100 mm by 100 mm or 300 mm by 300 mm. So depending upon the, the size of the particles which are actually involved and to prevent the scale effects the sizes of the uh, you know the direct shear boxes need to be uh, adopted. 
and uh, is also used to determine the soil stress strength and not the uh, you know determination deformations and uh, the, the different sizes of the shear box can be used depending upon the grain size of the coarse grain soil or the grain size of the soil under consideration or soil like material under consideration and the sample is loaded first and with normal stress and uh, and then you know subjected to a shear force so that the shear can be applied on a predetermined uh, shear plane uh, which is actually induced the shear is actually induced along the predetermined failure plane so this uh, you know method of testing also makes uh, possible uh, for you know determining interface parameters like uh, when you have got uh, uh, you know uh, let us say that uh, two different materials let us say that pile interacting with the soil or when you have got a uh, you know retaining wall interacting with the soil and if you would like to have the interface friction angle uh, you know then you know uh, the particular uh, material can be kept at the bottom and a dummy uh, dummy block can be placed and then the, the required uh, interface surface actually can be put and then the required soil which is to be interacted with uh, you know the particular surface can be placed. So with that you know we can actually determine the interface parameters and when we do when we try to determine the interface parameters then it is actually called as modified direct shear test and with that uh, you know we get C A in case uh, if you are having a, a cohesive soil then adhesion is actually measured and uh, then interface friction angle. So uh, you know this direct shear test actually has got uh, you know uh, you know uh, a pre, uh, the, applica the the method of uh, you know inducing failure plane uh, failure along a particular plane is used actually um, as a uh, way for you know determining the interface parameters or if you wanted to determine uh, you know interface friction angle between uh, let us say a rock and uh, you know surrounding uh, soil outcrop then you know that can also be uh, achieved through this particular uh, method of testing. So this typical uh, you know direct shear uh, uh, test configuration is actually shown here it actually has got a shear box and uh, it uh, you know in order to this the uh, some of the to some extent uh, you know uh, tests can be performed with uh, some uh, drained conditions uh, but uh, they are actually uh, regarded as uh, you know you can actually do but uh, not possible for us to measure any pore water pressure and other aspects and uh, here uh, you know the configuration is that you have got upper shear box and lower shear box and in order to induce uh, you know to keep the failure plane at the uh, you know the predetermined surface uh, the serrated plates are actually used at the uh, base and then these serrated uh, uh, you know serrations actually have to be perpendicular to the direction of the shear uh, so that uh, you know the uh, failure is actually induced along that uh, failure, predetermined failure plane and in order to allow the drainage uh, uh, you actually have the porous stones and uh, then you know we have the loading plate and through this loading this loading plate can go down or go up so it is you know which is slotted here and this actually with the lever arm arrangement we actually apply the normal stresses maybe can the range of 25 kilo pascals to you know 300 kilo pascals to 400 kilo pascals normal stresses can be you know applied and then what it is done is that you know the shear force is actually applied you know as shown here and with that uh, you know the shear the resistance offered by the uh, you know interacting soil or soil uh, surface is actually measured. So with that you will be able to get the, the, the shear stress versus uh, shear displacement. So what uh, when we apply uh, when we apply the shear force uh, if this is the direction of uh, force and uh, you know then uh, uh, then there is uh, you know shear force is actually generated and the shear displacement is generated. So uh, the when we do a different normal stresses we actually get a set of curves for each normal stress which is actually performed and then you know the, uh, depending upon the type of the soil whether it is a dense soil or whether it is a loose soil uh, we have uh, you know the variations in the, uh, the types of the, the pattern of the stress curves changes similarly if you are having a you know undisturbed sample let us say a war consolidated soil or a normally consolidated soil and the pattern of the stress distribution the shear stress versus shear strain variation is subjected to change. So here the mechanism is that at the start of the test what actually happens is that you have sigma n and sigma h so these are the major principal plane is actually here major principal plane is here and minor principal plane is perpendicular to this and at the beginning of the test when before the commencement of the test uh, 
you know on the uh, failure plane the major principal plane and the minor principal plane they do exist but uh, when uh, you know the test uh, commences or during the test because of the mobilization of the shear and then those uh, that particular failure plane can no longer be called as a uh, you know the pre, uh, you know predetermined plane over which the failure is being in, in, uh, induced it can no long can no longer be called as uh, you know the principal planes so in in that principal plane in that case you know then we have to see that uh, you know there is uh, a chance that in the in the direct shear in the direct shear test the rotation of the principal planes can actually occur and uh, here in this case the stress state at the end of the test is shown here so you have got a normal stress and then there is a shear stress which is actually mobilized so uh, you know this uh, makes it actually not eligible to be called as a uh, you know the principal plane uh, you know during the test and this is the normal stress remains constant uh, for a particular uh, sample for sample of the test so in this particular uh, figure the typical uh, you know uh, shear stress versus shear displacement for loose sand and medium sand and dense sand actually are given so as can be seen that uh, you know loose sand actually uh, has got uh, you know the continuously the hardening effect uh, can be seen but in case of a uh, you know the medium sand and dense sand and particularly for dense sand there is a predominantly a peak is actually observed and then uh, once the peak stress is actually observed and there is a decrease in the uh, you know peak shear stress with an increase in the shear displacement or shear strain so peak shear stresses are noted down at each normal stresses and uh, then you know when we plot these peak uh, shear stresses uh, for each normal stress what has been done then what we get is that the tau sigma uh, you know uh, uh, type tau sigma space we actually get the uh, you know the more uh, coulomb failure envelope the slope of that more coulomb failure envelope joining all these uh, tau 1 tau peak 1 uh, you know uh, sigma 1 and uh, sigma n1 sigma n2 sigma n3 and that actually gives the you know the slope of line actually gives the uh, you know uh, the internal friction angle and if it is actually intercepting at the tau axis then you know that intercept is actually taken as the cohesion of a soil so if, uh, when we plot in the direct shear test as we can see that here uh, uh, the vertical uh, uh, strain can be measured by putting a dial gauge and the lateral movement can be measured by uh, putting a uh, you know the in case for dial gauge or uh, a potentiometer or a LUDT so with that what will happen is that you will get uh, shear displacement or shear strain versus uh, you know vertical strain so this vertical strain can be uh, you know uh, in, uh, can lead to uh, expansion or it can be lead to uh, uh, compression so what actually happens is that in case if you are having a loose sand as can be seen here uh, it continues to harden so in line with whatever we actually observed for tau sigma you can actually see that this undergoes a continuous compression so in this case the contraction actually takes place but uh, in case of uh, dense and medium sand uh, for a given normal stress what will actually happen is that uh, you know uh, initially there will be a compression then thereafter what will actually happen is that as been discussed this was actually discussed in the previous lecture that uh, the soil particles ride on each other and then induce and make the you know the loading plate to move upward because there is no other way you know the particles that actually can uh, you know accord, accommodate uh, the, the disturbances which are actually created because of the shear so in a way what will actually happen is that there is a, a dilation or in the sense that expansion in volume takes place and this actually get uh, suppressed with a decrease in particle size and similarly uh, when we are actually having uh, uh, increase in the normal stress uh, the tendency of the dilation actually uh, keeps on uh, changing so volume keeps on decreasing for loose sand but in case of uh, dense sand and medium sand what will actually happen is that initially there will be a compression and thereafter uh, you know uh, the, there is an increase in uh, expansion of the uh, soil takes place upon shear so this actually uh, you know phenomenon is actually attributed to uh, the dilatancy effect or it is also the, the, the slope of that particular line is also called a dilatancy angle so as we said and uh, the we we can actually we can analyze uh, or you know look into this as a uh, you know uh, saw blade uh, you know uh, you know analogy so it can be seen that uh, when uh, a shear is actually applied uh, along the saw blade actually we have uh, the movement actually can take place so 
the apparent uh, you know externally mobilized angle of friction on horizontal planes pi is actually larger than the angle of friction resisting the sliding that is pi u or in the pi u or pi i is equal to friction plus dilatancy. So the strength is actually nothing but friction plus dilatancy that actually what uh, it actually uh, turns out to be. Now as we have seen that it can be uh, possible that uh, the soil can be in a very dense state and the soil can also you know at particular situation uh, that you know after uh, uh, you know a certain point actually where uh, the shear can actually occur at uh, you know constant volume then that is actually called as uh, critical uh, and uh, the, the uh, when this actually attains at a constant volume the no change in void ratio takes place that is actually the void ratio at which uh, you know no change in volume takes place then it is actually called as a critical void ratio and uh, then you know when you are having a initially loose then you know as we have discussed that these all loose uh, uh, pockets which are actually there they get, get filled with the soil particles so then that uh, the compression actually takes place. Uh, so the you can see this uh, the orientation of the saw blade analysis is actually given in the downward direction and here it is actually done in the uh, upward direction this actually shows that you know the riding effect and this is also some depositing effect like you know one particle will get uh, uh, jumbled into other particle in a way what will happen is that. Uh, there is uh, you know a decrease in the uh, volume takes place. So uh, let us look into this interlocking and uh, you know dilatancy phenomenon when soil is actually is initially denser than the critical state uh, where critical state is the place where uh, no volume change occurs which it must uh, achieve then as particles slide past each other owing to the imposed shear strain uh, the in average they on an average they will actually tend to get separate and the particle movements will be spread about a mean angle of dilation that is called psi and in a dense sand there is a considerable degree of interlocking between the particles takes place and before shear failure can take place this interlocking must be must be overcome in addition to the frictional resistance of the points of contact. In fact the peak actually which is attributed in case of a dense sand samples is actually attributed to the interlocking effect which actually you know results in the mobilization of the peak shear stress and thereafter you know the softening actually takes place. So in a dense sand there is a considerable degree of interlocking between the particles and before shear failure can take place the interlocking must be overcome in addition to the uh, you know frictional resistant at all points uh, of the contact. So in this uh, particular slide uh, you know uh, we can see that uh, the variation of the volume increase for a dense sand and loose sand is actually given here in this case of dense sand there is a contraction in this in the case of a loose sand for a given normal stress we can see that there is an increase in uh, volume takes place. So this is uh, you know the slope of this line that is d epsilon v that is the change in vertical strain or volumetric strain to the shear strain uh, you know that is actually regarded as the that uh, you know the uh, angle of uh, dilatancy. So in general the degree of interlocking is greatest in the case uh, case of very dense well graded sands and uh, soil particles with angular which are angular in nature the texture of the particles if it is angular and rough and there is a possibility that the degree of interlocking is the greatest and basically in the case of very dense sand or well graded soil mix and then the, the angular particles and the characteristic stress strain curve for an initially dense sand shows a peak stress at a relatively low strain and thereafter as the interlocking is progressively overcome the stress decreases with increasing strain. So the, the characteristic stress strain curve for an initially dense sand shows a peak stress that is what we have discussed at a relatively low strain. And thereafter, as the interlocking is progressively overcome, the stress becomes the stress decreases with increase in the strain. So the reason for you know having you know absorbed peak and then decrease in the stress value with increase in strain is attributed to the you know, the breaking of that interlocking which actually was provided till that time. And then upon shearing, the once it is overcome the interlocking, then what will happen is that there is a decrease in the stress with an increasing in the strain. So the reduction in the degree of interlocking basically produce an increase in the volume of the specimen. So the reduction in the degree of interlocking. So this particular reduction of or breaking of this interlocking results in the increase in the volume of the soil specimen which is being subjected to shear. 
So, as characterized by the relationship between the volumetric strain and the shear strain in the direct shear stress. So, uh, the reduction in the degree of interlocking uh, produces an increase in the volume of the specimen and during the shear as characterized by the relationship between the volumetric strain and the shear strain in the direct shear test. Now the term dilatancy is used to describe the increase in volume of a dense sand during shearing and the rate of dilation can be represented by the gradient which is nothing but what we have said is the d epsilon v by d you know nu which is the maximum rate of the corresponding to you know peak stress. The angle of the dilation psi is nothing but tan inverse d epsilon v by d nu. And for a dense sand the maximum angle of shearing resistance pi max is determined from the peak stress is significantly greater than the true angle of friction. So we have you know maximum peak, peak friction angle that is actually determined at the wherever we have the tau peak is there and when you pick up these values and plot the Mohr Coulomb envelope with normal in the tau sigma space. Then you know what will actually happen is that the slope of that line which, which is actually having a peak shear stresses which is actually called as the pi max and there is also true angle of uh, internal friction that is actually nothing but uh, uh, you know the frictional resistance offered by the individual particles and for that actually it is uh, pi u it is called and that is pi mu it is called pi mu, mu indicates for the frictional uh, the sliding friction and the difference representing the uh, you know there is a difference between these two you know between pi max and pi mu and uh, that is actually because the difference representing the work required to overcoming uh, overcome the interlocking and rearrangement of the particles. So uh, pi mu is actually more than pi max uh, pi, uh, pi max is actually more than pi mu and this is basically the difference there is a difference between pi max minus pi mu this basically the difference uh, is attributed to uh, you know the work done which is actually required to overcome the interlocking and the rearrangement of the soil particles. Uh, then we said that when you have got initially loose uh, soil sample uh, there is uh, a no significant uh, you know interlocking takes place and the particles uh, uh, always tend to uh, you know arrange into the new position and uh, you know in the way that uh, the soil undergoes uh, a contraction upon actually shearing and the shear stress increases gradually to an ultimate value without a prior peak and accompanied by a decrease in the volume. So uh, the in case of initially loose sand there is no significant uh, particle inter interlocking takes place. So that is the reason why there is no peak is actually observed and uh, the shear stress versus shear strain variation is actually that and uh, the shear stress continues to increase and uh, after reaching uh, the at large strains it actually tends to become constant. So in the case of initially loose sand there is no significant particle interlocking to be overcome and the shear stress increases gradually to an ultimate value without a prayer peak and accompanied by a decrease in volume. But when soil is initially looser than the final critical state then the particles will tend to get closer as the soil is disturbed and the average angle of you know dilation is negative and indicating a contraction. So the angle of dilation is actually negative that is actually indicates a contraction actually takes place. So let us try to you know interpret between pi max and pi mu and pi cv. Pi cv is the friction angle at constant volume and cv indicates at you know at constant volume and so in this particular slide a tau versus you know shear, shear strain is actually shown here and where for dense sand and loose sand the shear stress variations are shown here as can be seen that the shear stress is actually maximum here and then you know the peak is actually distinct peak is actually shown and then there is a decrease in shear stress with an increase in the shear strain and it tends to become you know in join with the curve wherein you know when we have got the hardening actually takes place continuously for initially loose sand and becomes denser by virtue of shearing. So this uh, the thus at the ultimate or at a critical state the shearing takes place at a constant volume uh, and the corresponding angle of shearing resistance uh, uh, being denoted as pi cv or pi critical it is called pi cri or critical friction angle critical friction angle and the difference between uh, pi mu and pi cv represents the work required so this is actually this gives the pi cv and this actually require this is somewhere here uh, you know uh, somewhere here the uh, this is due to 
uh, the sliding friction the sliding uh, that is uh, because of the frictional resistance offered by the particles in arranging into the uh, you know uh, you know the uh, into the uh, denser configuration uh, is actually is uh, uh, you know indicated uh, with the, uh, the phi mu and here the difference between pi mu and pi cv uh, represent the work required to rearrange the particles in general the critical state is defined uh, identified by the extrapolation of the stress strain curve to the point of constant stress and which should be also correspond to the uh, point of zero rate of dilation on the volumetric strain stress curve so this also corresponds to so the wet ratio at which this uh, you know this particular uh, phenomenon occurs this is actually called as the critical uh, you know void ratio and uh, this is the critical void ratio so this is the you know uh, you know the in the critical state is identified by the extrapolation of the stress strain curve to the point of the constant stress and which should also correspond to the point of zero rate of dilation on the volumetric strain uh, volumetric strain shear strain uh, curve now uh, you know we all the now we said that at uh, constant uh, volume when the friction angle uh, is interpreted then it is also called as critical friction angle or pi cv and if the density of the soil does not have to change in order to reach the critical state there is a, a zero derivative as the soil shear at shears at the constant volume but it is important to realize that a critical state is only reached when the particles have had a full opportunity to juggle around and then come into new configurations that means that a progressively uh, you know this uh, state is actually achieved and if the confining stress is increased while particles are being moved around then then they will tend to finish up in a more uh, compacted state so that arrangement will not actually happen. Now among uh, phi max and phi cv in practice the parameter phi max which is actually is called as a transient value and should only be used for situations in which it, it can be assumed that the strain will remain significantly less than the corresponding peak stress. So if for a given structure when it is actually being designed when the strain is actually uh, when the, the, the strain is actually less than uh, you know at which the peak stress is actually interpreted then you know the uh, you know pi max is actually uh, can be recommended for use. So in practice the parameter phi max which is a transient value and should only be used for situations in which it can be assumed that the strain will remain significantly less than the corresponding uh, uh, to the peak stress. If however the strain is likely to exceed the corresponding to peak stress, if the strain is uh, you know likely to exceed the corresponding peak stress, a situation that may lead to progressive failure, then it is actually a critical state parameter when phi, phi CV is shown. So, so when when we need to use phi CV, when we need to use phi, phi max is actually clarified in this slide. If however the strain is likely to exceed, the strain in the sense that induced for a particular geotechnical structure is exceeded. Uh, you know that the corresponding to peak stress a situation that may lead to progressive failure then the critical state primarily uh, parameter uh, pi cv should be used. So uh, here uh, when we look into this uh, you know uh, uh, for the interpretation of uh, uh, you know the uh, direct shear test and we actually said that when dense sands or war consolidated clays are sheared they dilate. So when dense sands actually are war consolidated clays. Uh, you know when when they are subjected to shear they tend to dilate and larger the particle size greater is the dilation and the decrease of the particle size actually decreases the tendency of the part the soil to dilate and more coulomb uh, idealization implies uh, dilation at a constant rate when a soil is sheared and this is actually uh, you know appear to be unrealistic so when dense sands or war concentrated clays are sheared they own they tend to dilate and larger the particle size and greater is the dilation and the decrease in the particle uh, size suppresses uh, you know the dilation tendency and also increase in the normal stress and increase in the war burden also suppresses the, uh, the dilation tendency. Now uh, you know we let us look into the interpretation of the direct shear test uh, results and uh, then you know we will try to look into some uh, example. And here the peak shear stresses are noted from the shear stress versus shear displacement or shear strain curve and at each normal stress the peak stress is actually when it is picked up and when it is plotted here and the line joining this you know this envelope is actually resulted as a more coulomb failure envelope and if it is a purely frictional soil and with negligible amount of fines 
there is a possibility that uh, you know the friction angle uh, the envelope can actually pass through uh, origin and uh, important aspect we should remember is that while plotting these results the tau sigma uh, curves have to be on the equal scale uh, so that the proper uh, you know interpretation can be done. So there will be you know like uh, one or two or three basically minimum three are required and uh, if you are actually trying to do like say five normal stresses and so you will actually get the five number of shear stress displacements and a plot of the peak, peak shear stress versus normal stress do give uh, the shear stress parameters phi and c from the a particular soil. So we will able to uh, get the c and phi for a particular, so a particular uh, soil uh, from this curve. And uh, further uh, you know uh, there is a way where, where we can actually construct the more circles because here in this case uh, what we are trying to do is that uh, we can actually construct the more column failure envelope and we know actually this particular point. So what we can do is that uh, you know this is the this point uh, you know more circle more, uh, uh, more column hypothesis actually states that when more, more circle is in contact with the uh, failure envelope. Uh, then you know that is the point where uh, you know uh, the failure stress the tau shear stress, tau failure shear stress actually achieved uh, at a particular normal stress. So here for sigma n1 tau f1 is the failure shear stress, sigma n2 tau f2 is the failure shear stress, sigma n3 tau f3 is the so this is actually the dotted line which is actually shown is the uh, you know failure envelope and uh, now you know with uh, uh, with uh, particular uh, you know dropping a perpendicular to the uh, sigma axis from the uh, failure envelope we can actually locate the center of the Mohr circle and with this as actually a center we can actually if you draw a, a Mohr circle then we will be able to locate uh, you know major principal stress and minor principal stress and uh, uh, from the known uh, uh, stress state on the uh, stress state on the Mohr circle if you draw a line horizontal parallel to the sigma axis it actually intersects at a point P and that point is actually regarded as a pole and from the pole when we join these points to uh, major uh, principal stress uh, ordinate here and minor principal stress ordinate here then actually we can get the inclination of the major principal plane and minor principal plane and uh, so when we draw the Mohr circle we will able to get the uh, you know major principal plane and minor principal plane uh, locations and the magnitudes of the stresses and the direction of the principal planes and all. So as can be noted if you look into that initially when the uh, when uh, you know when you start the uh, you know the prepare the sample and then kept it for uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, equilibration also at the time when the no normal stress is uh, when, the, when the normal stress is applied when the no shear stress is applied when we have got along the predetermined uh, horizontal plane you actually have uh, you know the principal planes but uh, upon shearing and uh, during uh, shear uh, test actually in a case of direct shear test uh, the principal planes are subjected to rotate and they rotate in the direction of uh, uh, shear and uh, the degree of angle of rotation of the principal planes uh, is approximately uh, you know regarded as equivalent to the uh, friction angle of a soil and uh, so like, like this when we do uh, you know different normal uh, stresses and uh, when you get register uh, tau f2 and tau f3 the failure stresses you can actually draw uh, these uh, more circles and these uh, more circles from the from here onwards uh, so the line which is actually joining to this uh, parallel to this one that is actually is nothing but the uh, you know the it indicates the failure plane and uh, this indicate when you when you when you when it is actually meets at the point say p1 here and it is joining here then this is called the uh, you know major principal plane uh, inclination and when it is joining to this particular point that is called minor principal plane. So we actually can determine the angle of the inclinations of major principal planes and minor principal planes and then magnitudes when we know the stress state points at failure for sigma n1 and then tau f1 or sigma n2 and tau f2 and sigma n3 and tau f3. So this is the initial condition uh, it has been as it been described uh, here initially when we actually have uh, you know sigma n0 that is the normal stress uh, uh, let us say a 50 kilo Pascals or normal stress is applied and for a normally consolidated soil uh, you know when you take uh, air pressure at rest K0 as say 0.5 then in that case the horizontal stress which is actually there in the soil is uh, you know sigma H0 is equal to K0 into sigma, sigma n0 
So 50 kilopascals into 0 0.5, let's say 25 kilopascals will be there. So when we draw that, when we have the normal stress sigma and not, and uh, you know the this is called initial Mohr circle, and this much this Mohr circle is actually well below the uh, well below the Mohr Coulomb failure envelope. Then we actually have discussed it that uh, the uh, this Mohr circle is uh, regarded as the stable uh, condition. Then further, when uh, with that same normal stress. Uh, you know when we try to increase uh, induce the shear then what will actually happen is that uh, the, uh, the Mohr circle actually uh, you know the uh, generates uh, the uh, you know the shear force and with that what will happen is that the Mohr circle uh, uh, you know uh, becomes like this. So with that what will actually happen is that uh, you know you can actually get a point where uh, uh, you know it uh, the, you know reaches to the failure. So that is actually uh, you know the, the during the test and uh, before the failure, and uh, so from here, if you look into this here, when you have this point at uh, failure, so what we have discussed is that uh, you know when you draw uh, in order to locate this and this when point is actually drawn, so this is the center, this is the center, and this is the radius. When you draw, when this is the radius, when you draw the Mohr circle, then you can actually get a Mohr circle tangential to the uh, the so-called failure envelope and then passing uh, you know this point and this point and uh, then you know when you draw and locate a pole then uh, when you join it to the major principle stress here then what you get is the major principle plane. So the major principle plane is here and minor principle plane which is actually here. So these are the you know directions or inclinations of the minor principle plane and major principle plane. So let us uh, consider an example uh, wherein a direct shear test is actually run on a medium dense and uh, dense uh, sandy silt. Uh, with uh, normal stress of 65 kilopascals, at failure uh, the shear stress is observed as 41 kilopascals, and draw the Mohr circles at the initial and failure conditions and determine uh, principal stresses at failure, and the orientation of the failure plane, and the orientation of the plane of maximum normal stress at failure, orientation of the plane of maximum shear stress at failure. So these uh, you know uh, issues can be addressed. Uh, uh, you know by uh, the discussions whatever we have we had till now. So initially when uh, uh, normal stress is actually applied starting at the test then uh, the 65 kilo Pascals is actually located here and uh, when we when we locate with uh, as a being a silty sand and uh, friction angle is actually given as 32 degrees. So when, when we take uh, using Jackie's formula K0 is equal to 1 minus sin phi and with that 1 minus sin 32 degrees is equal to then you know it comes out to be around uh, uh, 35 kilo Pascals and with that uh, you know uh, 65 minus 35 that as 30 kilo Pascals as the diameter when you draw the Mohr circle you will get the initial uh, Mohr circle for the initial condition. Then uh, you know it has been given as uh, you know the failure shear stress is actually located at 65 kilo Pascals normal stress at a the normal stress is actually somewhere around 41 kilo Pascals. So uh, what actually happens is that uh, uh, you know when you locate that point and uh, because it is given as uh, silty sand and cohesion is actually assumed to be 0 and then it actually passes through the horizon. So with that what we can actually get is that you actually have got uh, tau sigma envelope this is the tau and uh, sigma envelope actually here uh, passing through the this is, this is the point which is actually uh, at 65. Uh, and 41. So uh, when uh, the, the so the angle of internal friction is equal to 30 degrees, the slope of the line passing through the origin and point that is 65 and 41. And uh, then you know in order to find the center of the circle, uh, you know with uh, uh, you know by dropping a uh, you know perpendicular from here, uh, then you know we can actually locate a point where it actually. Uh, you know intersects the center then with this as the center and uh, and this as the radius we can actually draw a Mohr circle and that particular Mohr circle uh, you know represents you know the Mohr circle actually uh, becomes like this and then because we have taken this as the radius so it becomes tangentially here and this particular point where it actually intersects sigma and that is actually regarded as the minor principal stress. So in this case about 40 odd kilo Pascals is actually is the minor principal stress and here sigma 1 is actually here about 140, 140 kilo Pascals is the major principal stress. So uh, we actually have located uh, you know the Mohr circle and drawn the Mohr circle 
and uh, the theta which is actually 45 plus 5 by 2 uh, that is actually 45 plus uh, 32 by 2 which is actually 61 degrees angle between horizontal and the line joining the center of the circle and point 65 41 is 180 minus 2 theta which is about 58 uh, uh, degrees. So that is actually here is indicated here. Now uh, you know horizontal line is extended through point 65 41 to the point to the other edge of the circle uh, which actually gives pole and uh, the line drawn through the intersection points between the circle and normal stress axis gives the principal plane inclinations to the horizontal. So as we have discussed that when we draw this line uh, from the point to this point and this point we will actually get the inclination of the principal planes uh, we, uh, you know, with reference to the, the more circular diagrams with that we will be able to get uh, the, uh, the we can locate we can see that uh, you know initially when the sample is actually uh, just prepared then we actually have got uh, 65 degrees and about 30, 30 odd kilo Pascals as the minor principal stress. But now the principal stresses magnitude has increased as well as the direction also changed in the direct shear test. So further uh, in continuation of whatever uh, we have been discussing uh, uh, you know uh, we can actually look into uh, you know the, the another way of uh, plotting the shear stress versus uh, uh, you know the shear strain data as the ratio of tau by sigma dash uh, for a different uh, sigma dash when we actually take with increase in sigma dash actually in this direction C actually has got lowest B and A then you know uh, there is uh, a, you know typical A B C plotted actual are shown different sigma dash and same E naught E naught initial water ratio is actually same for all the uh, samples which are actually shared at div three different uh, normal stresses both maximum stress ratio and ultimate or critical water ratio decreases with increasing effective normal stress. Uh, then the difference between maximum and ultimate stress uh, decreases with increasing effective normal stress. So the value of the pi max for each test can thus be represented by a secant parameter and the value uh, decreasing with increasing effective normal stress until it becomes equal to pi cv. So because of this particular phenomenon what actually happens is that uh, at low effective stresses uh, you know you we actually have uh, you know the difference between uh, uh, you know uh, the critical friction angle as well as the uh, you know pi max that is the peak friction angle. But uh, when it actually has got uh, the normal stresses actually increase then the uh, what actually happens is that the suppression of uh, you know the uh, you know the peaks actually appear and then uh, you know predominantly the hardening actually takes place because of that what will actually happen is that you know they merge to the pi cv axis. So you can see that uh, you know at high normal stresses high effective stresses there is a uh, the beyond uh, you know point b you can see that there is a uh, you know merging of uh, these angles takes place. So uh, this particular uh, phenomenon is actually attributed to the decrease in the ultimate void ratio. Uh, so the both maximum stress ratio and the ultimate or critical void ratio decrease with increasing effective normal stress. And the difference between the maximum and ultimate stress decreases with increasing the effective normal stress and the value of the pi max for each test can thus be represented by a secant parameter and the value decreasing uh, with increasing effective normal stress until it actually becomes equal to pi cv. So uh, after having discussed uh, the direct shear test uh, it actually has got uh, you know first of all the direct shear test is a simple test and actually allows uh, to determine the strength parameters of soil. Uh, very easily and uh, uh, and the failure plane is actually one to be noticed that the failure plane is actually predetermined and uh, and uh, very difficult to you know control the drainage condition but however to some extent what it can be done is that when you have got a shear box and if you wanted to get to some extent uh, you know uh, consolidated and drained uh, parameters uh, what it can be done is that the sample can be prepared and particularly if you are having some silty sand uh, or silt samples the samples can be uh, prepared uh, either under remolded conditions or undisturbed conditions and they allowed to uh, you know saturate under a particular uh, normal stress over a period of time then uh, you know the shearing can be done uh, you know at very very low uh, strain rate so that uh, the stress the you know the there is no generation of excess pore water pressures during the shear. So with that uh, you know with this exercise we can actually get uh, drained parameters up to a maximum extent otherwise you know basically the total strength parameters are actually obtained 
and uh, so in a way uh, the pore water pressure measurement is actually difficult and uh, only the total stresses can be determined uh, in this particular case and shear stress on the failure plane are not uniform uh, as uh, failure occurs progressively from the edge to the center of the specimen. So one thing we need to notice is that the shear stresses on the failure plane they are actually not uniform uh, as the failure actually occurs uh, progressively from the edges uh, to the center of the specimen and area under the shear and vertical uh, loads does not remain constant throughout the test. So one more uh, you know assumption uh, you know observation we have to make is that uh, the area under the shear and vertical loads uh, you know does not remain constant uh, throughout the test and the soil is actually you know forced to shear along the predetermined plane and which should not actually necessarily the weakest plane. So if you look into that uh, you know we actually have uh, you know imposing failure along a predetermined plane which may not be the failure plane in the uh, particular sample in such situation is actually you know uh, we are actually regarding as uh, you know the failure to take place along a predetermined uh, failure plane and uh, the another uh, disadvantage or demerit uh, which actually comes as far as uh, uh, you know direct shear test is concerned is the rotation of the principal planes as we have seen that uh, during shear the principal planes undergoes rotation in the direction of shear and the uh, angle of rotation of this principal planes is, uh, uh, is approximately uh, you know estimated as the, uh, the uh, you know the inclination of the uh, failure envelope with the horizontal that is the friction angle and uh, so, uh, so these are the some uh, you know disadvantages which are actually listed here and uh, the only advantage uh, with the direct shear test is, uh, is simple and in case of sands is easy for the sample preparation. So another advantage is that you know the interface parameters and this is actually where uh, you know uh, when you have actually got uh, multiple uh, interface layers nowadays uh, you know when we actually design uh, a landfill lining system when we wanted to have uh, you know the sliding friction values or in case of the reinforced soil walls when we wanted to have a sliding friction between the reinforcement which is actually being in when which is interacting with the surrounding soil in order to get these parameters or interface between a geomembrane interface and soil under uh, you know different conditions like uh, you know without uh, water or with uh, uh, you know uh, uh, with the presence of the water in a number of cases actually where uh, uh, you know the interface uh, characteristics can be analyzed and this is actually becoming very handy as far as uh, you know determining uh, uh, you know these uh, uh, the use of the direct shear test is actually concerned. Now as we said that uh, the another way of uh, determining uh, the strength parameters is the triaxial compression test. In fact the triaxial compression test is the uh, first physical model test which actually wherein uh, you know wherein the in situ conditions are actually attempted to be simulated. So here uh, this uh, triaxial sample actually simulates let us say that if you are having a, a soil sample collected from uh, a certain uh, uh, you know certain uh, uh, depth uh, let us say at uh, say 5 meters depth or 10 meters depth and then you know the soil sample will be actually having a vertical stress and uh, the lateral stress which is actually equivalent to let us say an equilibrium conditions it is K0 uh, times sigma V and with that what will happen is that it is subjected to uh, these conditions. Now on these conditions let us say that there is an increase in the uh, you know uh, vertical stress which is actually happening and upon that increase in vertical stress if you wanted to see what is the angle of uh, the resistance actually offered by the soil and that can be actually simulated by using this particular type of test which is actually called as a triaxial compression test. So this actually test actually has got uh, you know a uh, you know one of the uh, widely used tests wherein you can actually get uh, uh, you know uh, you know have the parameters which actually can have well controlled drainage conditions the soil strength parameters can be estimated very very accurately and mostly based for shear strength tests and suitable for all types of soils and wherein you can actually do on uh, very soft soil and very uh, not very soft soil and where soil sample can be made to stand and, uh, and then also loose sand, dense sands yes different techniques need to be adopted and uh, it needs to be considered. And one important point we need to actually uh, uh, highlight is the L by D ratio. So in this case the L by D is actually maintained as 2 uh, that means that length of the sample is always the 2 times the diameter. Uh, this actually uh, you know one uh, particular uh, uh, 
you know requirement which actually needs to be satisfied is that you know because of the L by D is equal to 2 what will happen is that the failure plane will remain within the uh, within the sample length only the otherwise uh, you know if you are noticing uh, whatever we are actually applying on the the horizontal surface and uh, along the uh, you know uh, along the uh, this vertical plane and these are actually regarded as the minor principal planes and they actually remain as minor principal planes during the test and even the end of the test. So that means that you know in the case of uh, triaxial tissue test whatever the limitation which we actually have said the two major things one is that you know the non uniformity of the shear along the failure plane and uh, induced failure plane and the rotation of the principal planes those limitations are actually overcome very easily in a triaxial shear stress and the typical uh, sample diameters for the uh, you know the sample specimen diameters for uh, uh, triaxial shear tests are the 38 mm 100 mm and uh, 300 mm and uh, 38 mm is generally used for uh, uh, you know the small samples 38 mm diameter and 76 mm height or there is also one more intermediate size which is actually 75 mm diameter and 150 mm height or 100 mm diameter and 200 mm height or 300 mm diameter and 600 mm height in some special cases where we are actually having a large size particles then even you know 1000 mm diameter or 500 mm diameter and 1 meter height or 1000 mm diameter and 2 meter height very large triaxial test cells are also available nowadays. So uh, in this uh, particularly what we do is that the sample is actually prepared under either from the disturbed or undisturbed conditions or remolded uh, sample is actually prepared or undisturbed sample is actually placed and the sample sizes are such that you know the uh, from the different sampler tubes we can actually can collect the samplers and then you know uh, preserve the uh, you know original soil fabric and original uh, preserve the, the, the degree of the disturbance and so that in situ shear strength parameters you know directly the samples which are actually corrected from uh, the borehole investigations the same thing can be used here and with that uh, when you can when you perform and different types of drainage conditions we are able to maintain then there is a possibility that you would be able to determine the strength parameters suiting to the field conditions depending upon the, the type of the uh, you know uh, you know the stress test which you are conducting uh, can be adopted. So this is the you know typical uh, uh, component of a triaxial test where you actually have got a sample and a chamber uh, in which uh, you know what you have is that uh, uh, you know the confinement is actually provided in the form of filling the water. So initially when the sample is actually placed and to as an interface uh, you know there is a membrane which is actually placed called rubber membrane and uh, then you know the load cell which is actually placed here this is the pork or loading ram and inside is actually filled with uh, water and this water is actually pressurized to different uh, uh, pressures and uh, you know when we are actually having uh, you know uh, sigma 3 1 sigma 3 2 and sigma 3 3 different cell pressures are actually applied. So, and then for different cell pressures uh, when it is actually applied initially uh, the pressures are actually uniform and then you know uh, to in order to simulate uh, the increase in the load what actually happens is that you apply uh, deviator stress. So with sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 uh, plus uh, you know uh, sigma 3 plus P by A and uh, you know that is actually you know what we get is that sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 plus p by a and what we regard as sigma 1 minus sigma 3 as the deviator stress the difference between major uh, principal stress sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is actually called as the uh, you know the deviator stress. So we get deviator stress versus uh, axial strain and uh, that is in case when you are actually doing a compression test. So sometimes uh, you know we can actually have controls on the uh, you know you can actually arrest the movement of water so that means that uh, no volume change is actually allowed then in that case we can simulate undrained conditions and we can also measure what is the pore water pressure upon shear when the drainage is actually not limited in a saturated sample and uh, when suppose uh, if you are trying to uh, you know drain the water and uh, subject it to uh, you know shearing condition then you know what will happen is that uh, the uh, the uh, you know uh, consolidated uh, uh, drained conditions or drained parameters are obtained. So in the next lecture we will try to look into further about the triaxial test and further we will try to uh, look into the uh, other aspects of the interpretation of the triaxial test results.